Yeah, I'll let them introduce their talk and let's welcome our speaker. Hi, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Chris. I'm presenting this paper on behalf of Thiago Castro Ferreira, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. The paper is called Neural Data to Text Generation and Comparison Between Pipeline and End to End Architectures. So, first, I want to focus on data to text. What is data to text? Data to text is basically the translation of a, a data representation, a non linguistic representation, into nice, coherent, natural, fluent text. And uh, systems like this are used for many applications in academia. You see them for healthcare, for weather reports, for sports reports. And also in industry, it's starting to grow more, more popular. So you see that the companies are starting to use it for weather reports as well, for financial reports, and also for, for robot journalism. And if you make this distinction between academia and the industry, uh, there's also a similar distinction between a pipeline and end-to-end. So pipeline used to be very popular in academia and still very popular uh, for uh, the industry. You see that a lot of systems there are still using a pipeline architecture. But in our academia, we slowly started to go towards end-to-end -to -end approaches with the rise of neural networks. End-to-end -end approaches became more interesting. So uh, I want to go over pipeline and end-to-end -end shortly. So pipeline, uh, this is the traditional uh, way of doing data-to-text generation. The idea originally was that the whole conversion of data-to-text was too complex to do it all at once. So you had to uh, use several steps or several modules to do this. Uh, so first you use the document planner to figure out what to say, and then with the micro planner you figured out how to say it, and finally you realized it into a fluent text. Uh, the pipeline architecture that we're using are, is going to use most of these traditional mod modules as well. End-to-end -end is uh, more popular nowadays. It's just very straightforward, or at least it seems to be very straightforward. You have your input data, you put it into a neural network and fluent text comes out. And this is what you're seeing a lot. So no more explicit intermediate representations in between just going directly from data to text. There are some pros and cons to both architectures. So pipeline is very popular in the industry because it's very transparent. You know what's happening. You can control what is happening. So you know kind of what the outcomes will be, what kind of text you will get. But to build a pipeline architecture demands a lot of manual label, uh, labor. You have to build all these separate modules there. End-to-end -end, uh, doesn't really require as much manual labor because you don't really have to build all these sub-modules. But there is no uh, real transparency. There, it's just a black box. You don't really have control over what the outcome will be. But on the other hand, you see in many tasks that end-to-end -end approach is uh, performing really well. Uh, it achieves state-of-the-art uh, performance, for instance, on machine translation. But actually, it's not really fair to say that end-to-end -end is the better performing architecture. Because as far as I know, there hasn't been uh, done a real direct comparison between a pipeline architecture and neural architecture. So a reason for this is usually that people assume that a pipeline architecture is more of a traditional rule-based system. But there's not really a reason why pipeline architecture cannot be a neural system. Uh, well, there is a practical limitation. So uh, if you look at most of the data sets that exist for these kind of tasks, most of the, the, these data sets only contain uh, the data representation and their aligned uh, textual outcome. Uh, and this works very well for end-to-end -end approaches. But if you want to build a pipeline module, a neural pipeline module, you have to have explicit intermediate representations there as well. So an example of a data set that's commonly used for these types of tasks is the web NLG data set, and this was the one we also used for our experiment. So it contains 25,000 instances, or around 25,000, where you have RDF triples, and then the textual realization of these RDF triples. Uh, what Thiago did last year was he built an enriched web NLG data set that also contains intermediate representation, so it contains information about the order in which the triples appear, uh, it contains sentence information, it contains referring expression, and contains templates where the uh, entities, the referring expressions, are taken out and replaced by placeholder gaps. So to recap, uh, the problem that exists is that there is not really a direct comparison between a pipeline architecture and an end-to-end -end architecture. And with these data sets, it was possible to 
uh, do a direct comparison. So you want to see how well a neural pipeline architecture performs compared to a neural end-to-end -end pipeline. I'm going to go through the neural pipeline that we used first. So uh, we uh, created a pipeline that consists of five steps. The first three steps, discourse ordering, text structuring, and lexicalization, is done using gated recurrent units or a transformer uh, using Nematus, which is a state-of-the-art uh, machine translation system. The fourth step is done by Neural Rack, which was uh, built by Thiago. It was presented last year at ACL. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this uses a bidirectional LSTM. And textualization is done using rules. It has a parallel corpus for textualization. So discourse ordering is, go is the step of going from uh, randomly ordered RDF triples to uh, an order which, according to the algorithm, is a sensible order. If you have this ordered, ordered triple set, you get the structuring step where you go from the, uh, the order triples into, uh, uh, it adds sentence information, so how many sentences should be in the realization and uh, what kind of information should be in which sentence. After that comes the lexicalization step where this sentence information is used to uh, find a suitable uh, uh, template. So it generates a template for this uh, sentence, uh, sentence information. Then comes the referring expression information where you have this uh, 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 template and you try to add uh, the referring expression information to uh, the template. And finally comes the textual realization step where you, go, uh, where you have the uh, uh, verbs and the, now, or the determiners and you put them in the right format. So having this uh, just to recap, you go from uh, unordered uh, RDF triples to an ordered RDF triple set to an R ordered RDF triple set with sentence information in there to a uh, delexicalized sentence to a lexicalized sentence and finally like a realized sentence where uh, all the right forms are used for, de for the determiners and the verbs. End to end is a lot quicker. We also used Nematus for this one. We also tried uh, gated recurrent units and a transformer, but we just uh, used the triple, uh, unordered triple information as inputs and tried to get uh, full textual realizations as outputs. So after building both systems, we wanted to see how good they performed. Uh, so we did an uh, evaluation. We used automatic uh, metrics, automated metrics, blue and meteor, which is quite standard uh, for this kind of task. And also, uh, we did a human evaluation and just presented uh, a paper on the importance of human evaluation at INLG. So I was kind of forced to do a human evaluation. We did twofold. We did a quantitative study where we looked at uh, fluency and semantic or clarity. And we also did a qualitative analysis where we looked at information retention and over-generation. So first I want to look at the automated metrics and the quantitative evaluation. And there you see that uh, overall the pipeline seems to outperform the end-to-end -end system. So you see that the uh, transformer is uh, achieving the highest blue scores and the gated recurrent units are performing best on all these other metrics. And also the fluency and clarity were significantly better than the other uh, fluency and clarity scores. Uh, so this looks quite positive, and we wanted to find out where is end-to-end uh, -end struggling. So then we looked at uh, domains that were seen in the train set and unseen domains in the train set, and that's uh, where a lot of the trouble for end-to-end -end is coming from. So you see that the pipeline architectures are generalizing quite well. So uh, for instance, the blue score for uh, the pipe GRU was 55.75, and it dropped a little bit to uh, 38.55. But if you compare it to the end-to-end -end one, it has the highest score for the scene domains with 57.20, and it drops all the way down to 6.25, which is a huge drop. A similar thing you see for fluency scores, for instance, uh, a 5.40 drops to 3.45 for the end-to-end -end GRU model, while for the pipeline, the GRU stays relatively similar with a drop from 5.51 to 4.91. So there you see that uh, the end-to-end -end is really struggling with unseen domains. So an example of uh, what's going wrong there 
is, uh, I have it here. So this is an example from Ace Wilder. I don't really know her, but apparently she is a singer from Sweden. And you see that the pipelines are producing quite a good sentence. So Ace Wilder, born in Sweden, performs a songwriter, or Ace Wilder, born in Sweden, was songwriter. So not all the information is in there, but it is a good sentence and it contains some of the information. You see the end-to-end -end is it's really going wrong. The test pilot who was born in Wellington, who was born in New York, who was born in New York and is competing in the competing in the USA. The construction of the city is produced in Mandesh, so it's, it's basically rubbish what it's producing. Here also the test pilot Elliot C was born in Dallas and died in St. Louis, which is also not at all aligned with the data that we had. So you see that there is a lot of overgeneration going on there and also like uh, not all information is retained. So uh, also for the pipeline, not all information seems to be retained and that's why we also did a qualitative study to see where it was struggling with information retention and you see uh, comparing the different pipeline architectures that they, they have uh, different uh, strengths and different weaknesses. So GRU uh, starts off, so uh, the ordering starts off relatively similar, so it retains, uh, for the GRU it retains almost 77%, transformer 75%, GRU drops down a little bit for the structuring step to 73% information retention, while the transformer drops a lot more with 69%. But there you see the step from structuring to text goes a lot better for transformer, where it only drops 1% more. And there, uh, GRU is dropping from 73.6 uh, to 67. So these, they have different strengths and weaknesses, and maybe if you combine the two uh, kind of algorithms, you can even increase the score uh, more if you just have them do the, the steps that they're best at. I wanna also compare information retention uh, for all uh, uh, the methods that we tried, so end-to-end -end and pipeline. Uh, and there you see that there is a huge difference between uh, the, uh, the textual output for a pipeline and end-to-end. -end. So almost two-thirds of trials uh, for pipeline retains inf all the information. Well, for end-to-end, -end, uh, the GRU, about half, uh, uh, still has all the information there. And Transformer, almost a third, has all the information in there. So there's a huge difference between the two. And a similar thing we see for over-generation. So this is hallucination. It tries to uh, uh, implement some information that's not really in the data. And the GRU is very good at this. It has virtually no uh, hallucinations in the text. Transformer has a little bit with 8%. And for the GRU and the Transformer, you see that it goes up to almost 50%. So that's a lot more. So in conclusion, we were quite happy with the pipeline approach. We saw that in general, it's uh, more fluent and more clear than the end-to-end -end approach. And also it generates better on new domains. End-to-end uh, -end performs pretty good on the scene domains, but it cannot really generalize as good as the pipeline architectures. But there should be like a, a note here. So we also had some statistical baselines, some smart statistical baselines, and we saw that they were also pretty competitive. They were not as good, but they also achieved good scores. So it seems to be like this is not a soft case at, uh, yet at all, uh, which is where I want to end. So uh, thank you for listening. If you want to find out more, you can send Thiago a tweet or you can go to his GitHub page. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll have time for questions. So regarding the results on the end-to-end, -end, but even just the transformer, don't you think that probably one of the main reasons is the lack of data? Because I, if I remember correctly, you, you are only using a few thousand of training data, and I think 20K. Yeah. Well, uh, in, in general, for speech recognition, machine translation, and to end, tend to work much better with way more, uh, with a much larger scale of data. Do you, mm -hmm. do you, do you think this might be the, the real problem? Yes, yeah, so this might be a very, a good, so this is a big problem that we're faced with data to text generation where we don't really have corpora or data sets that are as big as in other tasks. So uh, I think if you can increase the data set, that there might be some differences in the results as well. So this might also be a case of uh, enough data. But uh, as well, like it, uh, the pipeline seems to perform better on the smaller data sets that we have. So there's something to say with the current kind of data sets that we have to work with that the pipeline approach is uh, at the moment the best one.
Hi. Um, this is sort of a continuation of the previous question. Mm -hmm. Have you tried uh, to do sort of an ablation study to kind of see how, uh, which of the two approaches generalizes faster? So is, it, is the pipeline approach just generalizing faster or is it just like a constant thing that, so it, you know, is, is good mm -hmm. at the beginning? Yes, yeah, an interesting question. I'm, we haven't looked at this one yet, so it would be interesting for follow-up research to look at this kind of ablation. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, so uh, I have a question. Do you have any comment on, uh, for example, in these analysis, do you, in light of this, do you suggest we work more on pipeline or we're trying to increase the data size or do you have anything that you want to share? Ooh, <laughs> a lot of freedom there. So it's, it's a bit of both. So I, I think the, the uh, idea of having more uh, bigger, better data sets it's very interesting for data to text, so the, the current data sets that we have are kind of limiting. So this is well, this is crowdsourced, so the quality is quite good. But if you want to use this in real world, world applications, the quality is, it has some noise there as well. So it would be interesting if we could have some more uh, real life kind of data sets for this kind of task as well and see how results are affected by this. Speaker again and Thanks.